Welcome back to Ruthless Metal, and today we're going to take on Judas Priest's discography. And they have been a constant request ever since I did my first Drink em All video. And since it's Christmas and all, I thought why not give people what they want. And Judas Priest is of course one of the most prominent metal bands of all time. Heck, they even reshaped the look and sound of heavy music in the late 70s. And they've been around for more than 50 years. And there is many who tried to prove that they're faster, but they didn't last and they died as they tried. So don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe, because now it's time to take on the world of Judas Priest. The worst Priest album is in my opinion Demolition from 2001, and I think that the majority of Priest fans agree with me on that. This album came out when Rob Halford was out of the band and Tim Ripper Owens had taken over the microphone. But my issues with the album ain't about Ripper singing, because he's a competent vocalist, which he has proven several times over, even in Priest. Just look at the Live in London gig from 2001, his performance is flawless there. My problem with Demolition is that it's aimless, boring and uninspiring. The album just plods along and there ain't much interesting going on here. Plus the production has this modern thickness to it, and you guys know that I'm not really into that dry and downtuned sound of the 90s. It just bores me and so does this album, even if it's one of Priest's heaviest albums. Demolition is also an hour long so it really tests my patience. For me this is without a doubt Priest's worst album. Next. In 17th place we have Juggalator from 1997, and this was the band's first album with Tim Ripper Owens. And I'm sorry to say that I ranked both of his albums at the bottom of my list, but as I said it's not really his fault. Because I'm not the biggest fan of the direction that they took during the Ripper Owens era. I must also say that I think that Juggalator is a much better album than Demolition. This one was more interesting and it had much cooler time changes than Demolition that was just stale and boring. And it was also Priest's first album since 1990's Painkiller, so we can safely say that it didn't live up to its expectations. And this is definitely one of Priest's heaviest albums, and it even reaches thrash metal territory on a few tracks. And I'm a huge thrash metal fan, so I should perhaps like this album more than I do. But I can't say that this album rocks my boat, it just felt a bit forced, and I never really got into the ripper air of the band, except for Live that is, where I think he did a better job than on those two studio albums. But at least Juggalator is a better album than Demolition, so next. In 16th place we have Nostradamus from 2008, and this was the band's first and only concept album. And it's about the life and prophecies of Nostradamus, a 16th century writer and astrologist. And this is a double album with 23 songs on it, 1 hour and 40 minutes to listen to the whole thing, and in my opinion that's just too much of an undertaking. But I think it's cool that they finally did a concept album, and Nostradamus is an interesting figure but I rarely listen to this album just because it feels more like a chore than something that I truly enjoy. And there's a lot of strings and choirs on this album, and it's definitely a step away from the heavy metal sound of their past couple of records, and more into the symphonic realm without fully leaving the classic priest sound. And there's a few short 1 minute or 2 minute breaks in the album, like The Awakening or The Four Horsemen, which I think is good because you don't want to listen to the exact same sounds for that long. So a little bit of variation goes a long way. And Prophecy and Nostradamus are two of the more memorable tracks from this overly ambitious mammoth of an album. Next. In 15th place we have Redeemer of Souls from 2014. And this was the first Priest album without founding member and guitar legend KK Downing. And Richie Faulkner was chosen to be the band's new guitarist, and he does a solid job on this album. But at the same time, who can replace KK Downing, it's just impossible. And Redeemer of Souls was more of a traditional priest release in comparison to Nostradamus. The strings and orchestrations are gone and this is more in the style of old Judas Priest. 
And the album starts off quite convincingly, but after a handful of songs it kinda goes downhill from there. Redeemer of Souls, Halls of Valhalla, Sword of the Markless, and Battle Cry are some of the more interesting moments of the album. And for a relatively new album, it's alright I think, but it's not a new Defenders of the Faith. So, next. In 14th place we have Turbo, and this album must have been confusing when it came out. Sure, Priest went in a slightly more commercial direction with those early 80s albums, but Turbo takes that easygoing 80s tone to a new level. And there is a lot of synthesizers on the album, and the drumming is very basic to say the least. At the time Turbo was criticized for going down that glam metal route, and there are some air light arrangements and big choruses here, like in the tracks Rock You All Around the World, Private Property or Parental Guidance. And we also had the monster hit Turbo Lover, which was a rather cheesy song, but it was surely played everywhere. But I'll suggest that you check out Reckless instead, which is a much better song in my opinion. And Turbo might have gotten some bad reviews back in the day when it came out, but underneath those synths there are a few cool tracks, but I still have to put Turbo quite low on my list. Next. In 13th place we have Angel of Retribution from 2005, and after 15 long years, Judas Priest was finally back with a new album featuring their formerly estranged vocalist Rob Halford. And the album kicks off with Judas is Rising, which is a perfect song to start the album with. It's powerful and it's one of the best songs that the band has written since Painkiller. Deal with the Devil is a cool track, and the Angel was one of the bigger hits from the record, and it's like one of those old priest ballads. And then we have Hell Rider, which I think is a true gem, and it reminds me a bit of Hell Patrol from Painkiller. It definitely sounds like a track that could have been a part of that album. At its best moments, Angel of Retribution is a great album, but then there is a song like Loch Ness, which is just the sad excuse of a song, it's over 13 minutes long, and the album ends on a low note, but overall, Angel of Retribution was a breath of fresh air when it came out, and for the first time in ages, it felt like Priest was back again. Next. And in 12th place we have their latest studio album to date, which is 2018's Firepower. And this is my favorite post-painkiller album. And sound-wise, it's like a modern painkiller. Not as good, obviously, but this one is a modern classic if I ever saw one. Firepower, Lightning Strike, and Evil Never Dies. The first three tracks are amazing. And it's also the best produced Priest album since Painkiller. And worth noting is that Rob Halford was 67 years old when this album came out, which is rather remarkable since he has more power in his voice than most 30 year olds have. And overall, Firepower is a very solid album I think. The only thing that I'm not fully sold on is that photoshopped artwork, but at least it pays homage to albums like Screaming for Vengeance and Painkiller. Next. In 11th place we have Ram It Down from 1988, and this album was released between Turbo and Painkiller, and that's exactly what this album sounds like. The album is a bit of a roller coaster, songs like the title track Ram It Down, Hard As Siren and Blood Red Skies are cool, but then there are a few songs that sounds like leftovers from Turbo, like Love Zone, Heavy Metal and Love You To Death. And the big hit from the album was the cover of Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, which is kinda a meaningless cover, it's just never a good idea for great bands to do cover songs. I mean it's fine if you put it as a b-side on a single or something, but please keep it off the albums. Next. In 10th place we have 1981's Point of Entry, and this was the follow up to the commercially successful British Steel album. And point of entry is a bit uneven in my opinion. Songs like Heading Out the Highway, Desert Plains and Solar Angels are all great, but there are just too many radio friendly fillers on this album. Point of entry is kind of a more commercial and more rock oriented version of British Steel, and a song like Hot Rockin' felt like a precursor to the Turbo album. 
And despite a few great tracks, point of entry is kinda bland, just like the cover art. Next. In ninth place, the Priest's debut album Rockerola, and it came out back in 1974. And this album is quite different from the albums that followed it, Sad Wings of Destiny, Sin After Sin and Staying Class. It was just not produced like those albums were. Rockerola sounds older, and I would describe it as some sort of bluesy hard rock with progressive elements. And it seems to be widely regarded as Priest before they found their sound and style because they still looked like hippies back when this album came out. But even if the guitars lack some distortion, I'm a big fan of Rockerola. One for the Road is great, the title track too. Cheater and Never Satisfied sounds like something of Sad Wings of Destiny. The ballad run of the mill makes me think of Early Rainbow, and Caviar and Meths was co-penned by the band's original vocalist Al Atkins, who had left the band before they hit the studio to record this album. So even if this is not a stained class or a Sad Wings of Destiny, I still think that you can hear some hints of those albums in Rockerola, even if this album ain't as developed as those legendary albums. Next. In 8th place, The British Steel from 1980, and this was the band's big breakthrough, with hit songs like Breaking the Law and Living After Midnight, two of the worst songs on the album if you ask me. And I know that many Priest fans love this record, since it includes two of their biggest hits. But honestly, those were made for the radio, and they are far from the most intriguing songs on the album. And British Steel is far from Priest's best album, even if there are some highlights on this one as well. Just take the drumming for example by the new guy Dave Holland, it was very generic on this album. But there were of course some highlights here as well since I ranked British Steel on the top half of their discography. We had solid metal songs like Metal Gods, Grinder and Steeler, and Rapid Fire was a groundbreaking song. And there weren't that many faster or heavier songs from 1980 than that. And we really must remember that this album came out in 1980, when heavy metal was still in its infancy and it was still pretty much just a Judas Priest thing even if a few other upcomers had their first albums just out of the gate. And the whole upcoming new wave of British heavy metal took a lot of inspiration from this album. So it was not only an important album, but also a very iconic one. But in my book it was a bit of a letdown in comparison to their earlier work. Next. In 7th place we have another fan favorite in Screaming for Vengeance, and this album came out back in 1982. And it was a step up from Point of Entry that came out a year prior to this. Because this is a much more metal sounding record. And it starts out in a magnificent way with Hellion, that leads into Electric Eye. And we also have tracks like Bloodstone, Take These Chains, Devil's Child, and the title track Screaming for Vengeance. And of course the monster hit You Got Another Thing Coming, it's just classic priest. And in case someone thinks that I rank this album a bit low, it's not me dissing the album, because I think it's a masterpiece, but so are like 7 of their other albums as well. Screaming for Vengeance is just classic heavy metal at its best, and I absolutely love the yellow artwork, amazing. Next. In 6th place we have Killing Machine, or Hellbent for Leather as it was known as in the United States, due to Killing Machine being a too controversial title. And this was Priest's fifth studio album, and it was around this time that the band adopted the leather and studs look that later more or less became the heavy metal uniform. Killing Machine was a slightly more commercial release than the previous records, but it's far from a sellout album. In fact, I think it's a very complete album, with lots of great Priest songs like Delivering the Goods, Hellbent for Leather and Running Wild. And I usually complain about the covers, but I think that the Green Man Alicia with the two pronged crown is a very good cover, way better than the Fleetwood Mac original. So next. In 5th place we have Sin After Sin from 1977, and this is such an underrated Priest album. It's their first after signing a deal with CBS. And some of the best US Priest tracks of all time is on Sin After Sin. Like Starbreaker, what a great song that is. And Dissident Aggressor a song that was very influential for a lot of thrash bands. 
X Slayer, for example, that covered the song. And I can't think of a more aggressive metal song than that from 1977. And we can't forget about Sinner, another great track. But Sin After Sin ain't a perfect album. Last Rose of Summer is a rather mediocre song. And the big hit from the record was Diamonds and Rust, a song that the band still plays live until this day. And that was a Joan Baez cover, a popular singer-songwriter of the 60s and 70s. The song is actually about Bob Dylan, because Joan Baez and Bob Dylan had a romance back in the day. Anyhow, Sin After Sin is a great and very underrated album. Next. In fourth place, The Defenders of the Faith from 1984. And this is my favorite Edith Priest album, because there's a lot of amazing songs on the record. Like Free Will Burning, Jawbreaker, Rock Hard Ride Free, and The Sentinel to just name drop the first four songs on the album. And we also had the track Eat Me Alive, which the PMRC tried to censor. You know that filthy 15 list. It's clear that the goalposts have moved a long way since 1984, since there's hardly anything offensive about the song. Anyhow, Defenders of the Faith is a metal masterpiece, and it should be in the collection of every metal fan. Next. In third place, Web Painkiller from 1990. And it really hurts me to put this album in third place, since I think it's a remarkable album. In fact, it's more or less a perfect metal album. Drummer Scott Travis was new in the lineup, and his drumming really took Priest to a new level. It was such an improvement on Dave Holland's drumming. And with more intense drums, the whole band had performed their best to keep up, and they surely did. Glenn Tipton and KK Downing are playing like their fingers were on fire, and Rob Halford screams like never before. And I also absolutely love Chris Sangarides' production, it was more or less flawless. Painkiller is an all-killer, no-filler album. I mean, A Touch of Evil is like the weakest track on the record, and it's still a great song, so it's a remarkable album. I mean, if you don't like this album, then metal is perhaps not for you. And they also play faster here than ever before, which I do like. It was like they took the best ideas from their previous record Ram It Down and removed the slower stuff and just did everything a little better this time. There are so many great songs on this album, but the title track Painkiller is probably the best known song from the album. And it's a superb song. I really love the guitar solo in that one. It's probably one of the best guitar solos of all time. And I also love Hell Patrol, All Guns Blazing, Metal Meltdown, Nightcrawler, Between the Hammer and the Anvil. Yeah, I could mention all of the songs, but I won't. And I really believe that Painkiller was the best album of the decade, not only for Priest, but the metal community as a whole. It's that good. Next. In second place, we have Sad Wings of Destiny from 1976. And it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Priest reshaped heavy metal with this album. Sad Wings of Destiny is noted for its riff-driven sound, and the wide range of Rob Halford's vocals, and the album displays a wide variety of styles, moods and textures. Halford's high-pitched vocals, the dual guitar leads, and the moody atmosphere of the album was not only great, it was groundbreaking. Just listen to any new wave of British heavy metal record, and you can clearly hear the influence that Sad Wings of Destiny had on the whole wave. The first track of the album is Victim of Changes, and it's nearly 8 minutes long, but every second of it is near perfection. And then we have Ripper, which is not my personal favorite, since I think it's kinda silly. But it's still a good track though. Dreamer Deceiver is one of the best ballads of all time. And Rob Halford's vocal performance on that song is just otherworldly. Deceiver is a great rocker, and then we have Tyrant, a remarkably heavy song with many parts and tempo changes. And Genocide is a cool riff heavy rocker. And the Epitaph is a ballad that reminds me a bit of Queen. And then the album ends with Island of Domination. Sad Wings of Destiny is simply a masterpiece, and one of the absolute best albums of the 70s. Next. And the greatest Judas Priest album is in my opinion Stained Class from 1978. And this was Priest's fourth studio album, and on it appeared their fourth drummer, which was Les Binks who would stay with the band for two more records. And they really struggled to find the drummer, but Les Binks did a great job on this record. Stained Class kicks off with the song Exciter, 
a track that has been called a precursor to speed and thrash metal because it really upped the tempo and set a new standard for what people thought was possible back when it came out. And there are so many great songs on this album that I could have mentioned all of them but Better By You, Better Than Me, Stained Class, Invader, Saints in Hell, Savage and Beyond the Realms of Death must be mentioned here. I mean Beyond the Realms of Death must be the greatest ballad ever made. Priest are really one of the few bands that could pull off a ballad without making it cheesy or boring, which is a talent by itself. And there was also some controversy about the song Better By You, Better Than Me that led to a lawsuit where the prosecutor claimed that it had subliminal messages in it, which was just ridiculous. And if there ever was a perfect metal album, Stained Class must be in the discussions for that. It's my absolute favorite Priest album, even if I more or less worship at least the top 7 albums on this list. And speaking of the list, let's check it out. And this was just incredibly hard to do since they put out so many great records over the years. And this is of course just my opinions on these albums, and I understand that we all see things differently. So feel free to share your favorites or rank the full discography if you're familiar with it. And I've also ranked Halford Soul albums in another video, which I can link on the end screen of this one, so check that one out as well. And I hope that this video deserved a like from you, because the views of my videos has gone down lately. So don't forget to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe if you aren't already subbed up. That definitely helps the spread of my videos. And if you enjoy them, then you can become a Patreon to support my work, like these absolute sirs, or go and grab yourself some merch at the Ruthless Metal Store. And I'm also on Discord, Facebook and Spotify, and all my links can be found down below. And let me know whose discography I should take on in the next Rank and Mole video. And that's all from me, so thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye bye.